Learning outcome two, functions and graphs, 11.2.1a. Demonstrate the ability to work with various types of functions. B. Recognize relationships between the variables in terms of numerical, graphical, verbal, and symbolic representations, and convert flexibly between these representations. Tables, graphs, words, and formula. to work on today, Deboho? Graphs of quadratic functions. Can I have a look at your worksheet before we get started? Sure. By the end of the lesson, you should be able to recognize the relationship between the variables in a quadratic equation and the graph of a quadratic function. Determine the general shape and position of a graph of a quadratic function on the Cartesian plane. Calculate the intercepts of a quadratic function. Calculate the maxima or minima of a quadratic function and hence sketch a quadratic function. Before we get started, I think we should quickly go over some terminology we're going to be using in this lesson. Parabola. A parabola is the graph of a quadratic equation and it looks like this. X-intercept. The X-intercept is the point or points where the graph cuts the X-axis y-intercept. The y-intercept is the point where the graph cuts the y-axis. The turning point. The turning point or stationary point is the point where the graph stops briefly before changing direction. These graphs can vary slightly in shape. Some are smiling graphs and others are frowning graphs. Some are narrow and some are much wider. Now that we know this, we can start with the first question on your worksheet. You are asked to sketch the graph of f of x is equal to x plus 2 all squared minus 2. That's right. My teacher said these were graphs of quadratic equations, but I have never seen a quadratic equation that looks like this before. I know it may seem like you haven't seen quadratic equations in this form before, but we actually dealt with this form of a quadratic equation in the last lesson. We did? Yes. Here, let me show you. Have a look at this equation. Can you complete the square here? Yes, I, I think so. We did that before. First, I checked that the coefficient of x squared is 1, which it is. Then I move the constant to the other side of the equation. Now, I take the coefficient of x and halve it, then square it. which gives me 4. I add the 4 to both sides of the equation. This gives me a perfect square trinomial here on the left hand side. So I can write that in the factorized form, which is x plus 2 all squared. Then I take the constant back to the left hand side. Very well done, Devho. I see you've been practicing. Thanks. Now, have a look at this answer and the question on your worksheet. What do you notice? Oh, I see. Except for the f of x in this function, the two equations are the same. So that must mean the quadratic is written in the form of a complete square. So I have seen equations like this before. That's right. Although the form is a bit different from what we are used to, it is in fact a quadratic equation. It's important to note here that we haven't changed the original equation, just rearranged it. When we write a quadratic function in this form, it helps us to form a picture of what the graph will look like. So now we have two methods of representing quadratic equations. Each is used and has its own advantages. To convert from the completed square form, 
All we need to do is multiply out and simplify. Similarly, to convert from standard form, we would need to complete the square. The completed square form tells us the general shape and position of the graph of the function. So does that mean that the function is a bit like directions on how to draw the graph? Yes, I suppose you could say that. Cool. So how does it work? Let me show you using a graphing program. To start with, we'll only look at how the p-value in the function changes the graph. Here are five different functions. In each case, the value of p in the equation has been changed. Here is the graph of the function a of x is equal to x minus 2 all squared. Now, I'll add the graph b of x is equal to x minus 1 all squared and c of x equals x squared. d of x equals x plus 1 squared. And lastly, e of x equals x plus 2 squared. Now, Deboho, what do you notice about these graphs? The first thing I've noticed is that all the graphs look the same. They just seem to have moved along the x-axis. That's right, but can you be a bit more specific? When p is positive, the turning point of the graph is to the left of the x-axis. When p is 0, the turning point of the graph lies on the y-axis. When p is negative, the turning point of the graph is to the right of the x-axis. Very good. Do you notice anything else? Yes, I do. On this graph here, the p in the equation is minus 2, and the graph turns where x is equal to 2. In this function, p is negative 1, and the graph turns where x is 1. And on this graph, the turning point is at x equal to negative 1 and p is positive 1. On this side, when p is positive 2, the graph turns where x is negative 2. This tells me that the x-coordinate of the turning point must be equal to negative p. Excellent! Very well spotted, Debuho. So to summarize, we have discovered that the p-value in a function written in the form of a times x plus p all squared plus q tells us on which side of the y-axis the graph lies. If p is negative, the graph lies to the right of the y-axis. If p is positive, the graph lies to the left of the y-axis. We have also found that the x-coordinate of the turning point of the graph is given by negative p. Now, let's investigate how the q-value in the function changes the graph. For this investigation, we will again use five different functions. But this time, we'll keep p constant and change the value of q so that we can observe how this changes the graph of the function. I'm going to use the computer program again to save us some time. Right, here's the graph of x minus 2 all squared plus 2. And this is the graph of x minus 2 all squared plus 1. Now, I'll add the graph of x minus 2 all squared. x minus 2 all squared minus 1. And lastly, x minus 2 all squared minus 2. I can see what's happening here. OK, tell me what you've noticed. When the q value changes, the graph shifts up or down along the y-axis. And if the q value is positive, the turning point of the graph lies above the x-axis. When the q value is 0, the turning point lies on the x-axis. If the q value is negative, the turning point of the graph lies below the x-axis. Very good, Dewo. There's something else as well. Yes. If you look at each of these functions and their graphs, you can see that the q value in the equation is the same as the y coordinate of the turning point. So here q is positive 2, and the y coordinate of the turning point is positive 2. And here the q value is negative 1, and the y coordinate of the turning point is also negative 1. That's well done, Deboho. So to summarize, the q value in a function written in the form of a times x plus p all squared plus q tells us on which side of the x-axis the graph lies. If q is negative, 
the turning point of the graph lies below the x-axis. If Q is positive, the turning point of the graph lies above the x-axis. We also now know that the y-coordinate of the turning point of the graph is given by Q. This means that when we are given a function written as a complete square, we can tell just by looking at the equation not only the general position of the graph, but also what the coordinates of the turning point will be. Do you think you could apply this knowledge to another function, Deboho? Yes, I think I could do that. Okay. Given the function f of x equal to x plus 3 all squared plus 1, can you work out for me where on the Cartesian plane the graph will lie? Well, I know that p is positive, which means the graph must lie to the left of the y-axis. We also know that q is positive, so the graph lies above the x-axis. So the graph must lie somewhere here. The turning point is given by minus pq. So in this case, the turning point is minus 3, 1. Minus 3, 1 is here on the Cartesian plane. Can I ask you something? Yes, of course. How do we know that the graph lies like this and not like this? That's a very good question, Deboho. And it brings us to the next part of the function I want us to look at. We already know what the p and q values tell us about the graph, which leaves us with the a value. It is this a value which tells us the shape of the graph. If the a value is positive, the graph has the shape of a smile. If the a value is negative, the graph is shaped like a frown. So the graph turns here and will look something like this. Let's quickly review what we know so far. We now know how to find the general shape and position of the graph. We also know how to find the turning point of the function. Since we don't know how thin or how wide the graph is going to be, we would need more information in order to sketch it accurately. Can you tell me what else we would need to know about the function in order to draw an accurate sketch of the graph? Well, we would need to know where the graph intersects the x and the y axis. That's right. And do you know how to find the intercepts? Actually, I do. It's the same method we use to find the intercepts of any graph. To find the x-intercept, we let y equal 0 in the equation. And to find the y-intercept, we let x be equal to 0 in the equation. That's right, Debo. Do you think you could do that for the function we've just looked at? I'm pretty sure I can. To find the y-intercept, we let x equal 0, which gives me that y equals 10. So the intercept is at the coordinate 0, 10. Good. Now the x-intercept. OK. To find the x-intercept, we let y equal 0. Um, something's wrong here. I'm confused. Why don't you try isolating x? OK, let me give that a try. I take 1 to the other side, which gives me negative 1. Now I need to get rid of the square, which means I must square root both sides. Oh no, that's not going to work either. You can't take the square root of a negative number. What am I going to do? Don't panic. The fact that you can't find the x-intercepts makes complete sense. It does? Yes. Have a look at the rough sketch you drew earlier. This sketch shows the general position and turning points of the graph. Based on what you see in the sketch, tell me, where do you think the graph will cut the x-axis? Actually, it does not look like the graph cuts the x-axis at all. That's right, and that is why it makes sense that you can't find the x-intercepts, because there aren't any. When this happens, we say that the x-intercepts or roots are imaginary. If the graph intercepts the x-axis at only one place, in other words, it turns on the x-axis, we say the roots are real and equal. If the graph intercepts the x-axis at two different places, we say the roots are real and unequal. We call this the nature of the roots. Are you ready to sketch the graph? Yes, I think we have all we need now. The turning point is here, at minus 3, 1. The y-intercept is here, at y equal to 10 on the y-axis. 
The A is positive, so it is the shape of a smile, which means the graph looks like this. Very good, Debuho. Do you think you're ready to sketch the graphs of the quadratic functions on your own? Yes, I think so. Good. Here are some examples for you to try. Sketch the graphs of the following functions. <laughs> 